Up now is Ben Ellis with his talk, Tokyo Takedown, how 10 seconds can change the world. I am personally really looking forward to this. It's going to be awesome. There's better be loads of Takeshi Castle memes in it. Um, but no, it's going to be excellent. Ben, you're up, man. Take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Ben, and I'm going to be talking about Tokyo. So when we think about disruptions through the internet, everyone assumes it's turning off the power, crashing super tankers into support structures, or causing mega jams by turning traffic lights to red. But what I'm going to show you is in the air, how in the busiest city in the world, just by playing around some with, very, with some very minor things, can have quite a huge material impact on the world's biggest metropolis. Welcome to Tokyo, the city of Japan. They're the capital of Japan. <laughs> Apart from films like Godzilla, Kill Bill, and Tokyo Drift, what else do people actually know about this mysterious neon wonderland? To many, it's known as the city of convenience. So why is it called the city of convenience? Because everything in Japan, in Tokyo, is designed for perfect efficiency for everyone. Escalators everywhere. Vending machines, one, one at least every 12 meters, if not more. Transport has one of the best metros in the world. So what is it like to live in this paradise? Well, what better way to show you than to sh tell you a story? So let me introduce everyone to our main character, Han Lu. So can I ask everyone here to, can they, if they can do something for me really quickly? As I go through a good day for Han, I'd like everyone to imagine they're a hacker who wants to disrupt Han's day. It's 6 a.m. and Han wakes up and rolls out of bed. He has a shower. Now at 7 a.m., he leaves his apartment and heads to 7-Eleven for some breakfast before getting onto the metro. 20 minutes later, he changes lines at Shinjuku Station. Now it's about 12 minutes, 20, uh, 20 minutes past eight as he gets off the metro and starts heading towards his office. Before, before he gets to his office, he realizes he should go out and grab some lunch from 7-Eleven, so he does. He gets to work at 9 a.m. And then 10 hours later, he finishes work and goes and joins his colleagues for a meal out next to the station. After a couple of drinks and a nice meal, he goes home and falls asleep at 11 p.m. Now, I'm just gonna ask some quick fire questions. So who thought about turning off electricity so Han's alarm clock would not work? What about disrupting 7-Eleven's delivery service so he wouldn't get lunch? Who thought about shutting down the metro? And who thought about flooding Tokyo? Well, now I've talked about a good day, what about a bad day for Han? What could happen to ruin Han's normal day-to-day -day life? Let's see it through another story with Han. So Han is on his way to work and he pops into seven for some breakfast. The first thing Han sees is an ATM. Now this is something I like about Japan as there's always an ATM near all their convenience stores. But why is that? Well, Japan is still predominantly a cash-based society. So ATMs are needed everywhere. Han walks up, puts his card in and selects 2,000 yen. The ATM hums for about 10 seconds before spitting out his card in the yen. Now, I know with COVID being around, it's, a lot of people aren't picking up cash recently, but anyone used an ATM recently? How long, do you know how long it takes? Well, unknown to Han, the accuser have just skimmed his card. And this is an uncommon occurrence in Japan. A case of this is a group of nine, uh, of six men connected to uh, the accuser were arrested in, two, in 2016 for a heist of 1.8 billion yen. And this isn't the first case. Another six individuals were arrested in 2017 for defrauding an elderly lady out of 1.3 million yen. Now, having your card skimmed in the UK is quite a minor thing, to be fair. But in Japan, it can be quite serious. Now, Han is at the train station and he reaches the ticket gates as he pulls out his Passamo. Another beauty of the Japanese lifestyle. But what is the Passamo? Does anyone have, have a smart card for transport like, like the Oyster card in London? A Passamo I would describe as an Oyster card on steroids. You can use it to pay for public transport, vending machines, and even in stores. Passamo is um, based on the Vesela, uh, Sony Vesela system. Vesela is a form of RFD. Therefore, Passamos have a special RFC, uh, RFI and IC and an antenna room built into them, which allows for a fast transaction of about a tenth of a second. Unlike credit cards, it also has quite a large range, which helps with fast and efficient uh, payments, which 
are normally quite common with the use of high volume payments being made in train stations, for example. But with every positive, there must be a negative, which is the long distance. It makes it easier for drive by skimming. And unlike a credit card, the transactions are rarely recorded. So this means the Yakuza could just place RFD uh, skimming components on vending machines, for example, you know, in the back alley. Now, the system is certified for other uses in phones, but it doesn't mean it's as, as you know, safe enough to prevent drive-by skimming. That's what's happened to Han as he walks down the platform. So now he's about 500 yen short, which is the cost of a trip back home. Han joins the line for one of his carriages as the train pulls up. Anyone take the tube recently? I know with COVID it's unlikely, but I would like everyone just to do something really quickly for me. Imagine you're on the tube. It's rush hour and suddenly the train stops. What are you going to do? Well, eventually you're going to get out and walk to the next platform. Now, that's not really much of a biggie. But now imagine your carriage is four times fuller and the train stops. Now we're looking at something much bigger. So how would someone do that, though? Well, a power cut or ransomware is actually quite an obvious and has this quite a clear impact. So what are the hackers doing this time to mess with Han? Well, they haven't been as successful as they planned. They've caused a fire to outbreak at the next station as they were messing with the station gates and one of them overheated. Not, not, not much of a big, uh, big problem, surely. Well, I've seen the effects of a single fire on the Metro when three past colleagues of mine were three hours late. But that's not a major issue. The issue was a quarter of the Metro was shut that day. To put that in numbers, we can use Wimbledon being the, the oldest, tra uh, oldest ten uh, tennis tournament in the world and Shinjuku being the busiest train station in the world. Shinjuku is uh, estimated to have around about 3.5 million people go for it daily. So let's say a quarter of that use quarter of the Metro. That's about 875,000 people. So that's nearly a million individuals, which is about double the number of people that went to Wimbledon last year. Luckily, Han can get to work after the disaster of the morning he's had. But now Han has just got off work for lunch. So he walks into 7-Eleven and grabs some lunch before heading back to work. So why am I talking about a convenience store in the middle of a cybersecurity talk? Well, unlike Tesco's and Sainsbury's, 7-Eleven is a really important place for people in Japan. And it is a good example of how Japanese companies view cybersecurity. For example, July last year, 7-Eleven's payment, uh, payment service, uh, mobile payment service, let me correct myself there, um, was hacked. A total of 55 million was lost, which is about 400, over 400,000 pounds. But when 7Pay uh, uh, Co's president was asked why 7Pay didn't include two-factor authentication for its service, he was reported to repeat the phrase, two-factor what? And this isn't the first time someone said something like that. Now it's 10 p.m. Hans walking to the metro after a meal out with some colleagues. But to get to the station, he must cross the Shibuya crossing, which is said to be the busiest crossing in the world, with up to 3,000 people crossing in all directions at a time. Now Hans standing at the side of the road as cars fly by. The crowd keeps growing and the cars keep growing. Uh, uh, drive, uh, driving by. Another five minutes passed and the lights still haven't changed. And now there's around about 3,000 people waiting for the lights to change. Suddenly the green man appears and like a, a basket of marbles have been spilt, people just run across the road. But suddenly the lights go back to red. So then there's still a large, large number of people on the side of the pavement. Now this might give people a flashback of the Italian job where it's quite clear someone is messing with the traffic lights. But with so many people filling up the pavements, there's an actual issue of people being pushed into the road. And as people don't cross the road without the green man in Japan, no cars are expecting anyone to be in the road. Eventually, Han does cross the road. He reaches and he reaches the, the platform to get to a train to Shinjuku, where he must change lines to get home. Unlike the tube here, Tokyo Metro is owned by multiple companies. So it's normal to go for about six gates when, go, when using multiple lines. 
Han reaches the gate and swipes his card to go through, but it doesn't open. He steps back and swipes again. The gates don't open, but now there's two people waiting behind him. He swipes again and again until a fifth time. Bing, the gates open, and he walks through. But now he's left five other people behind him. The next individual swipes their card, and it happens again. So what's actually happened? Well, the hackers that have been messing with Han's day have increased the time it takes for the gates to open to 10 seconds. So instead of every two seconds someone going through, someone else has joined the queue for the gates. So with Shinjuku being the busiest train station in the world, we're talking about 900,000 passengers per rush hour. So with there being 200 gates, there should be 200 people going in or out of the gates in two seconds. So normally in 10 seconds, there should be about a thousand people possibly going through in or out the gates. But when the gates have been changed to 10 seconds to allow people to go through, it goes back down to 200. Now that's not count, and we're not counting the people coming into the station by tr through the other lines. So in a matter of minutes, Shinjuku could be a solid mass of people. Now let's take a note from Jade's call, uh, zero call and suddenly turn on the fire sprinklers. So let's just do a quick comparison uh, of Shinjuku and Britain's large, uh, busiest and largest train station, Waterloo Station. Waterloo is est est estimated to have 100.3 billion, uh, no, not billion, million p uh, passengers per year going through it. But Shinjuku is estimated to have 1,260 million people going through it per year. That's 12 times more. Now we could have hundreds, if not thousands of people all stampeding, trying to escape. Just imagine it. Now Han does eventually get home and he's so exhausted, he collapses on his bed and falls asleep. Then he's rudely awakened at 4 a.m. by his phone, screaming out, earthquake alert. Uh, so he rolls out of bed, he throws himself under the table. 30 minutes pass, nothing's happened. And this isn't the first time something like this has happened. Dallas is 156 emergency sirens were hacked in 2017 and were turned on and off multiple times for over an hour. Now Han is so exhausted, he falls asleep under the table until he's suddenly awoken again. But this time he's surrounded by water. Tokyo is flooded, but how? Well, dams. To be honest, when someone talks about dams, most people think of America or China, but never Japan. Currently, Japan is actually the fourth country with the highest number of dams in the world, with China and US being first and second. But why is Japan fourth? Because, well, because parts of Tokyo and Japan are known for flooding, and Japanese just like building dams. Tokyo is so famous for flooding that it has its own flood system. This kind of threat may not seem realistic, but with the old catching up the new, things are being put at risk like dams. Now, as I said, Tokyo has its own flood system, so surely that mitigates the risk of dams being hacked and causing sudden flooding. Uh, sudden flooding. Well, what happens if there's a power call or someone hacks the system? As seen in Guy Martin's TV show, Our Guy in Japan, the OS that the Japanese are using is as old as the dinosaurs. So imagine the damage that could be done if all the dams were hacked and the flood system didn't work. Of course, this would only work if the dams were full. So what is the hacker scene like in Japan? It does exist, but it's still young and small compared to other countries. This is because it is hard to find resources in Japanese to find the advice on how to teach people how to hack. So how does the scene grow though? Well, bulletin boards and underground markets. Bulletin boards play quite a large role in the development of Japanese hackers and cyber criminals. A famous case of this is when the demon killer hacker spread malware in the forum 2chan to infiltrate and gain access to users' computers in 2012. He was eventually arrested in 2013 for making a death threat. In terms of the Japanese underground, markets, you can guess what you can find there. Guns, fake passports, stolen credentials, etc. But also hacking advice. Want to destroy your enemies, exploit money, rule the world, where well, the Japanese underground has it all. So let's so that makes sense for the UQ's eye to utilize these gold mines. 
There's even been evidence of the Yakuza sponsoring cyber criminals in other countries like Russia. As in the ATM cases in 2016 case, there was a belief that the hackers outside of Japan were involved. So what is the state of Japanese cybersecurity? Well, it's doomed, in my opinion. But why do you ask? Because Japan is entering a stage of its history where the old way of life like the Bushido code and job for life is disappearing, which is leaving a hole in society, especially with the young Japanese. So let's talk about some examples of this. Loss of loyalty in the form of insider threats, like the case of an ex-employee of an information equipment cycling uh, company being arrested due to them stealing and selling hard drives that contained personal data in the form of tax records. Another example is companies not being honorable by not reporting data leaks for months. Although to give credit, this is also due to their culture of victim shaming. So as the king, one of the kings of technology, Japan seems quite relaxed to the cyber threats that threaten its economy, as this can be seen in the statistic of 84% of the Japanese adult population believing cyber threats are a likely risk but corporations only putting in basic countermeasures, as can be seen in a recent survey of 1,794 Japanese companies, where roughly 90% of the respondents said their cyber defenses were insignificant. So with that, with, with there being a lack of general education of cyberspace and cyber threats on top of all of that, it's led to a weak cyberspace. This also explains why a recent a 2020 global rating uh, of cyber capabilities by Harvard University ranked Japan as ninth, with the US, China, and Britain being the top three. It also, they also ranked Japan being the 12th, uh, 20th in the capability of monitoring possible attacks, which is a big concern, especially with the recent reconnaissance being done by Russia against Japan around the Olympics. William Sato, uh, an ex-special cybersecurity advisor for their, prime minister, their former prime minister at the time, once pointed out one of uh, that there are too many Japanese uh, people being unwilling victims in cybercrime as they are inserting unknown USBs into, into devices and clicking on dangerous links. So look at that from the UK viewpoint where learning basic cyber hygiene like not clicking on dodgy links is taught in secondary school. But in Japan, it's near and non-existent. It taps out to an aging population and you get a beginning of a recipe for disaster. And from an OSINT viewpoint, it's one of the easiest target, uh, countries to target. There's a lack of importance of keeping sensitive data safe, and it's normal to document everything with photos. So to sum this all up in the say, to sum it all up in the saying, water and safety are free, because of their viewpoint of Japan, uh, of, of cybersecurity is just on Japan, and also due to their isolated nation, uh, isolated island nation state mentality. To reflect how serious this is, the Japanese cybersecurity minister in 2018 admitted that he'd never used a computer. And if that's not enough, the fact that the minister was also confused when asked about if USBs were in use at Japanese nuclear facilities. All I can say about that is stagnant. So what can Japan do? As much as cybersecurity may seem like a bit like Tatashi Castle, where you end up running around in circles before landing flat on your face. Well, never fear, the UK's here. The small, there's a small light at the end of the tunnel for Japan. UK cybersecurity companies are slowly starting to help Japan, like NCC and NCD. But why are they only starting now? Well, in 2013, when Tokyo 2020 was announced, the UK government offered their help to improve the national level of cybersecurity in Japan. But the offer was turned down. Until around about last year, where they turned around and went, oh no, we need your help. But that's not enough. There's a massive demand for cybersecurity professionals in Japan, even bigger demand than the UK and America. So what can Japan do in the ever-growing face of cybersecurity threats before they get run over by them? In my opinion, Japan should take on the UK's national model. And they start to do that. They've now got a national center of instant readiness and strategy for cybersecurity. They've also set up a Cybersecurity Council as part of their basic act on cybersecurity. The purpose of the council is to enhance the information sharing between members of the council and to help promote cybersecurity. The Japanese also do take part in Cyber Awareness Month. Anyone who follows my Twitter may have seen my lovely 2018 awareness poster, but that's not enough. 
as a UK citizen and student, I'm used to seeing adverts, posters, leaflets, etc., talking about basic high cyber hygiene, like two-factor face authentication in the UK. But it's hard to find in Japan. Now, there are some universities that are offering basic level of cybersecurity courses. And the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications launched a national training center in 2017 with the intent of annually training 100 engineers under the age of 25 for 2020. But if they kept to that goal, that meant they trained 300 engineers just for this year. In comparison, that's nearly as many people graduating from my course from my uni in three years. There's also the fact that their general red teaming knowledge as uh, from, a, from a domestic and national level is lacking compared to the UK and America. To sum it up, Japan is quite behind in terms of domestic, its domestic and national level of cybersecurity. So how do I know this? Well, when I first took my first step into my cybersecurity career, I was given two tickets. The first ticket was a ticket into the UK, uh, UK infosec scene which is amazing, filled with amazing individuals and groups, but it's already quite oversaturated. I would just be another tadpole in the ocean. But what about that second ticket? That second ticket was a flight to Japan and a gateway into the Japanese infosex scene. So what is the ultimate message from this talk? Well, as a young man with so much to say, with so little time and an NDA on top of his head, I'm asking for someone else in this room to have a look at this amazing country that is a major contribution to our technology that we live and breathe. And for them to say, maybe I'd like that second ticket too. Thank you very much, arigato uh, Thank you to all the, everyone, beer farmers, mentors, and thank you for listening. That is also a key thing. Ben, that was awesome. Um, absolutely brilliant. Um, Loved it. Loved the storytelling element. So you're actually telling the story rather than just dumping. Here's all this cool stuff. Um, uh, that's cool, but this is awesome. Um, we have got a couple of questions from the audience. Oh. Um, first up, Dan Con has okay. said, as Japanese cybersecurity doesn't appear to be taken seriously, could this have a serious effect on their tech companies going forward as people from other companies get more security conscious? Uh Yes, it's my, my biggest risk and one of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk is actually a lot of people don't realize, as I said, about technology being a big part of what we use now as cybersecurity engineers and professionals and just to the general population in the world, Japanese technology is a key part and with them, with some of the domestic level stuff in Japan being very, we don't need cybersecurity is an expense, not a necessity. It's, I see it as a risk to not just the Japanese population, but yeah. to the rest of the world in terms of, you know, all it takes. And I'll, I'll use an example. I saw a, a tweet about a facial mask, which could translate. It was for COVID. And someone said, oh, great. You know, we could use that. We could hack that. And I'm like, yeah, that is actually probably quite possible because they're not going to think about it. They're looking for the usability. So that's my answer to that. <laughs> Cool. Up next, we have one of the beer farmers' very own, Ian Thornton Trump. You had a question. Hey, sir. I did. So, really, really interesting, um, a really interesting talk. And you know, it was about what is it? Two or three weeks ago, um, I, I believe the Japanese had demonstrated a, I think it was a fifty or sixty foot robot. Um, I have concerns that perhaps this robot does not have as robust cybersecurity um, as it should. The Japanese seem to be pushing the envelope in terms of technology. Um, so, so my question to you is, is that, you know, is the attack surface of Japan um, so large as a result of sort of all of the innovative and sort of... Um, future um, tech that they're experimenting with? Uh, yes, straight away, yes. It goes back to actually what I was saying about Dan's question. It, it's a massive surface and I think it will tie back a lot to what will happen to the rest of the world in terms of 
like I'll, I'll tell you now, like, I love the Japanese toilets, the fancy multiple button ones. I'd love one in the UK. And I think everyone should have one. They're amazing. But if that did happen, what is the risk of someone just hacking that? And I actually generally want to do this when I get out to Japan. I'm thinking about looking to do a little project to see if I could hack a toilet. I know it sounds silly, but that is the silly thing. They are producing technology that a lot of the UK and a lot of the rest of the world don't think of and don't do. And that is why I'm very concerned about their attack surface in terms of when the technology we're looking at and we're going, wow, that's amazing. And we bring that into our countries and the rest, the rest of the world takes it in. Is that just bringing another extra part to our attack surface as well? And can we prepare now and help Japan sort that out before it gets to us? So just, on, just on the back of that, it's a great answer. I um, I remember watching earlier this year or back in the last year, I remember James May, the uh, the Top Gear and Grand Tour guy, did a, a tour of Japan. And it was super fascinating stuff. But in one scene, he went to... Um, a supermarket, an electronics supermarket, and there were things in there that you would never have thought there was an application for, and just gadgets and this and that and the other. And all I did throughout that entire section was go, "That's hackable." Yep, that's hackable. That's hackable, and that was it. That's that's the only takeaway I got from it was that the proliferation of technology and um, is making the problem. It's compounding the problem. And Kazuki made a point in the, in the Twitch there about um, convenience being the driver. So when Japan produces technology, um, it's with convenience and usability forethought. And obviously when that happens, security takes a back seat and that's the problem that you've described in your, in your talk so well. So yeah, interesting, really interesting. To, to add to that, that is why I, the Tokyo is known as the city of convenience. It is designed to be convenient. I've been in those stores. They're amazing. I love them. But it is concerning when you walk in and you go, yeah, oh, you know, I wonder if I could hack that. <laughs> I wonder, if, I wonder if I bought that, brought that back to the UK and let a load of uni students just play with it. What would happen? And that is my biggest concern. If, if a uni student can do something with it, what can Lazarus do with it? What can Fancy Bear do with it? It's going from one level to an up, you know, I'm looking at the low level and going, well, what could the upper level do? And going from the upper level and going, what could the lower level do? So I have, a, I have a question that's kind of coming from Twitch. Um, toilet ransomware, lid won't open until you pay, or maybe it won't flush until you pay. What's your thoughts on that? I just want to get a general idea. Is that how you would go, or what, what would you do when you... Oh, I would make it bite you. I'd, I'd make it look like toilet. it. So I, I'll tell it. you a little story. So the first time I ever saw one, I went up to... Or I'd gone up north to go and see the snow monkeys, and I walked into the cubicle... And I closed the door and turned around. And I can tell you now, it's like a horror story. Slowly watching the lid go, and I'm like going, what is this monster? And my, I would, if I was going to do it, I would make it so that it would look like you're about to go to the toilet. So you'd sit down and it would just start biting you and just everything just sort of explodes, you know, just get water. Now, actually, I'll tell you one thing, which would I definitely do for the gentleman in this room. Um, so... For anyone who has not seen any of these toilets, there is a very fun fun function for the ladies of the room, as let's put it like this, which is allowed to help clean the front end and the back end. Now, I have not tried the front end on myself. I'm not planning to, but I think I'd be very concerned if I had a lot of quite warm water being shot directly towards a very sensitive area for myself. So you can see the concern of, I would would make sure, you know, fool them a little bit. It's like, it's like, Treat, treat it more like a Trojan with a ransomware on the back. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I, all right, so I have a suggestion for you then. Um, you know when you're doing your whole kind of toilet munchin episode? Right, play Baby Shark. That's all you need to do. That will just, that I, I will just die. I will end up in a ball on the floor laughing. Um, honestly, Ben, that was absolutely fantastic. I think we've wrapped up most of the questions and we're going to stop before we end up going down the route of uh, toilet-based hacks and ransomware. But um, I think that would be a ransomware I'd pay, though. I, I, I think if I was desperate, you know, that would be something I'd, yeah, 10 bitcoins, yeah, just take it. I need I need to use this toilet. Um, Sean, you got a question? Yeah. Um, so we hear about IO. S, not IoT, because the S is for something else. Um, 
it just seems like Japan is very much into the the how the whole IoT stuff. So, do you think we should move towards a uh, industry, probably across nations, um, reg- regulation and standardization of IoT devices? Yes, but there's actually quite an interesting point about this. So, in preparation for 2020, the Japanese government announced they were going to hack every IoT possible. I like, I'm not joking. They were going to do it, and they, I believe they have now. So, they were looking to see, you know, it, did someone leave the password as password? They were looking to break basically the country to go, look, we, can, we need to secure now. And the issue is, is as much as, you know, you do that once, that's great. But people buy more IOTs. And I think, yeah, if we came up with a regulation which would allow to, pre- you know, to prevent things like, you know, having admin, admin as your password and username, that would be wonderful. I think a lot of people would agree with me on that. Cool. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And again, awesome talk. Thank you very much. Cool. I think we're pretty soon so listen i go and grab ben on slack add him on twitter um absolutely brilliant research loved out we're going to go to the uh panel in about four or five minutes uh, we're just going to talk about <laughs> some interesting talks we've given over the time so um thanks ben you've been Thank awesome. you very much for organizing this yeah good job ben really good job thank you thank you very much